This is the moment that changed my life. You can see me here at 18 years old, standing atop the Olympic podium in Sydney, Australia, with my childhood idol next to me. She was up on my wall, pictures just like this. Jenny Thompson, a fellow New England native. I wanted to be like her. And on that night in Sydney, I led off the 4x200 freestyle relay, and she was our anchor with Lindsay and Diana in the middle. We broke an Olympic record, and we got to live that moment I dreamed about. And I stood on stages behind podiums and classrooms and auditoriums, and I told my story and signed next to my name, Dreams Come True, because they do. And I told the story of that five-year-old who wanted to be a gymnast. You can see my height. Didn't work out very well. <laughs> to the 15-year-old who was ready to quit and walk away from a sport she loved. To the girl who let off that relay. I told my truths. I shared my stories. I just didn't share all of them. There were parts of me and my story that I kept buried deep inside of me, parts that felt broken, parts I felt ashamed of. And all that changed. Four years ago, on the morning of November 22nd, 2013, when I witnessed my then 12-month-old daughter's heart go into ventricular fibrillation, sudden cardiac arrest, I was less than three feet away from her. That moment, the sounds, sights, smells, seared in my brain, forever changing the pathways. That moment of watching all those events unfold in room two changed me. And as the nurse pulled me outside into the hallway to watch the team of doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and secretaries rush to her bedside, I kept saying, fight. You have a twin sister at home. We cannot lose you. Fight me a fight. The longest minutes of my life. She's kicking butt now. At that time, I did not know that there was a machine called ECMO that would save her life. What I witnessed was them try to clear and defibrillate her heart three times. And all I knew from movies and TV shows, I was obsessed with Grey's Anatomy, was that was it. And the nurse looked at me and said, she has fought hard enough, let her rest, let them help her. And I stared back at her and my entire body shifted. Rest is bad, help is weakness. In that moment, her words shattered the perfectionist armor I had been wearing for 13 years. I had prepared and organized and charted and had graphs for where my kids would go. I had prepared every single possible detail I could and as I sat outside her bedroom, that hospital room, watching the events unfold, I wonder what did I do? How did I do this? What did I do wrong? Where could I have tried harder? And I realized there's no such thing as trying harder. The only thing I could do at that point was surrender and let them help her. My perfectionist armor, gone. Standing there completely vulnerable, actually sitting, rocking, back and forth waiting. The only thing I could do was hold on to the little pieces that I could. And during that 41 day stay at Children's Hospital, gratitude gave me life. The first seven days, we had no idea. It was complete uncertainty. We didn't know what would happen. We didn't know if she was coming home with us. We didn't know how. And every day I showed up, grateful for the signs the nurse made her gifts from complete strangers, the way the nurses arranged bows in her hair and treated her like the little girl she was. It allowed me to look past all the med lines 
in the deepest darkness of my life, I was able to find gratitude. There she is the day after we got home, hanging out with her sisters. She's dead center, like nothing ever happened. She is fierce, and there's a reason they gave her that name, Mighty Mia. You really don't want your child to be called a miracle at Boston Children's Hospital. It's not really a status that you want, and at the same time, it is, because they saved her life. And we went home and carried on, except I found myself under the biggest pile of rubble I had ever been in in my life. The microwave, the cold air, the sound of a helicopter, the smell of san hand sanitizer, people. Everything was triggering me and sending me straight back to those moments in room two. I had no idea if I would ever find my feet again and how long that would take. And I did. I'm here. Wherever you are, if you are in a darkness, there is light. And that light is inside of you. And that discovery, digging deeper into this concept of this light inside of us, it led me here to a blank page where I got to write my story. And in therapy, I worked with my therapist as part of processing trauma to tell the story, to tell the whole story not just the parts trauma wanted me to tell. And we would start, and I'd start by talking, and I'd be all over here, and I'd be rushing around, and I'd be t fragmented and chasing, and soon enough, I'd be on her floor, bawling my eyes out back in room two. And over time, she helped me pause and open space and go back so that I could see that those doctors and nurses, they weren't mutilating her body. They were saving her life. That mother who thought she lost her daughter didn't give up hope. She was letting go and surrendering. You see, when we dive into our stories and own them and go back to heal old wounds, we set ourselves free. Our work together led me back here. When my parents dropped off, okay, I still have bins at their house full of stuff. And they're tired of it, frankly. They're like, ready? You have a family now. Let's go. So they dropped off these bins 16 years shut of all my Olympic paraphernalia, my logbooks, all the things. I never looked at them. Didn't read the cards. None of it. And now I have four girls who are extremely curious, and it just so happened that the Rio games were on. And they were very interested. And it was the first time they had watched my race on YouTube. So as they dug through, I stumbled upon a logbook. The logbook that I kept that was supposed to be keeping track of all my races and all the details of practices. But that logbook at some point had transformed into a space for the inner critic to be in written word, a living bully inside my head. And when I cracked open those pages, just like we were doing in therapy with the trauma, to open and expand that story, those wounds were so painful. I had buried those, that, that, those pieces of me so deep that I lost my breath when I read the words. Fat, disgusting. After this is over, you eat three times a day, and that is it. The day before my race in Sydney, in the Olympic Village, in my bedroom, the day before the biggest race of my life, I was sobbing because I stepped on a scale. And those are the parts of the story that I told myself nobody wants to hear that. That's not the Hallmark version. That doesn't make people feel good. But what I realized is there's power in owning all of it. Because that 18-year-old girl, she is me. And there was a part of me that I was disowning and so completely suffocated by shame. And my therapist challenged me. And she said, 
what about the next Olympian who stands on that podium and that inner critic is there? What about that next Olympian who achieves that childhood dream and wonders, is this it? And I decided I'm going to share this story because the power of going back and healing these old wounds had set me free in my life today. Imagine if we could just set that 18-year-old free so she could experience that without that inner critic driving. And so I got excited and I told people, this is what I want to do. This is it. Former classroom teacher, I'm home with my girls. I'm going to have a new classroom. I'm going to help athletes. I'm going to help women who still struggle with this. And I had people say, you can't do that. You shouldn't. You shouldn't tell your story. You're going to hurt the people you're trying to help. And again, I lost my breath. Because that is the very thing that I got buried underneath. All the shoulds. We get swept away by shoulds when we're not where we think we are supposed to be. The expectations from others, the stories that we tell ourselves, we get swept away. Instead of being where we are and being okay stepping into that space, we get stuck in our own minds and we beat ourselves up and we let the inner critic roar because we're not where we should be. We don't look like we should look. We're not parenting how we should parent. We're not doing things the right way. And on and on. And that is exactly what happened to me when I arrived at the University of Michigan with a gold medal. I didn't know who to be. Who should I be? What should I say? I have this new title. And it buried me. And two months after standing atop that podium, I was out of the water with a shoulder that needed surgery. I was battling a full-blown eating disorder and battling depression. And I was so filled with shame, I didn't know what to do. Thankfully, found my way, much like today, to a therapist, a mentor, who helped me find that strength to get up again. But this time is different. This time, rising from the rubble meant leaving all of perfection behind. And I'm on a mission, because struggle is universal. And shame cannot survive sharing. One of the beliefs that really held me back was perfectionism. And it's this idea, well, if I just achieve this thing, if I just get that you know, romantic partner, get married, have that kid, get that promotion, if I just can do this, if I get my house in order, if I have this much money in the bank account, then I'll be happy. If I can just get to the top of the podium, then I'll be fulfilled. It's not, it's not that way. There's nothing out here that's going to fill you here. It brings temporary joy, but the deep lasting joy comes from in here. And it comes from the belief that you are worthy without conditions and that you are capable. Perfectionism kept me under the shield, as Brene will call it, this protective armor where I believed, just like I did in that hospital room, that it was my fault because if I had just controlled, when really all we're trying to do is be superhuman and not feel and we can, that's Wonder Woman. If you're, asking, you're wondering what we're doing there, we are channeling our inner Wonder Woman. But that idea that we're superhuman, not in Hollywood, not in Washington, not on Wall Street, not in the Olympics. There is no other class of human. There is no place or space where you can be protected from the pain of judgment, and blame and shame. It is part of the human experience. So what do we do about it? Here's how I've learned to cope. These are skills. What if we gave ourselves permission to be where we are? And I know if you're under that shield of perfection, you can't let up because that drive comes from perfection. It does not. Because the eternal student that I am and the recovering perfectionist that I am had to go to the data. I wanted to see, what does it say? Does perfection really drive me? Is that what got me to the top of the podium? And hell no. I got to the top of the podium in spite of it. Not because of it. If we give ourselves permission to be where we are instead of where we think we should be, what if we gave ourselves permission to be seen, all of us, fully, completely? And work I do with athletes, college teams of women, they say, whoa, okay, mm-mm, mm-mm, judgment, no way. It's too scary. What are you really afraid of? 
you're afraid to feel. So we walk it down and we say, you're not afraid to be seen. You're afraid of what people are going to say about you if they see you for who you are. But here's the thing. We can do that. We can learn how to feel. We can learn how to rise. And we can also learn how to ask for help. And we can carefully identify whose feedback really matters. And how we can expand our toolbox and skill set so that we don't stay stuck in emotion and buried in shame, but we can get up and move on with our lives and get back into the driver's seat. Permission to be human. What if we gave ourselves permission to be human, to fall, to fail, to go out after whatever it is you want, no matter what age you are, no matter what stories you're telling yourself? You gave yourself permission to be human and extended that back to those around you. For me, gratitude was the gatekeeper. It shifted my energy immediately. It still does. But to get home, to me, to stand here fully free, not feeling like a fraud, in my feet, compassion was the way home. That's a dirty word in the athletic arena. Self-compassion. It's pity. Excuses make you weak. You know what the data shows? That's the key to rising. Being able to meet yourself with compassion instead of making a mistake and beating yourself up for it, you make a mistake, whoo, all right. Regroup. I don't like the way that feels. I'm disappointed, I'm angry, whatever it is that you feel, you regroup, you get back up, you own it, you're more accountable, and then you lead with intention. Because self-compassion isn't accepting where you are, it's meeting yourself and saying, I'm human. Here, I now see a girl on a mission to live out her childhood dream that followed, in the, that followed her inner magic and those poles of her inner wisdom. And I also see an 18-year-old, both are true, who was wounded and cut open by the words of people closest to her. All of it true. We cannot control the curveballs that come our way. We always can control how we respond. And lastly, that responding, that's our rising, our resiliency. That is where we step back into the driver's seat of our life and we live our dreams. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.